This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome again on this lecture on thermal unit operations. We are still in the section of distillation and rectification. Today I would like to tell you a little bit of what one calls a distillation cascade. In the previous videos we have seen that, well, either we have very special systems where the relative volatility is high and that means that in that case we are luckily able to reach significant separations or in the more general case, we really have problems with the separation, with the single stage separation. Because, well, we realize that either the flow rate or the amount that we achieve is small, approaching even zero more or less, or that the purities that we can achieve are not so high. That is, we get a certain enrichment of either component in either of the flow rates or the amounts, but we are not really able to define the purity. And as engineers, of course, we would like to define the purity that we want to achieve and then build an equipment that allows us to reach that purity. But how can we do that? We can stack several theoretical stages on top of each other, and I mentioned that already in the introductory lecture, that actually the uh, real equipment consists of several theoretical stages. So we want to have a look how does that, at, at how does that work. This is an example for such a process. It's distillation. We have a first distillation stage. The feed, the first feed is entering. It's separated into a distillate and a bottom product. The distillate of the first separation stage, of the first distillation, distillation stage, is then fed into a second distillation stage. Here again distillation takes place. We achieve a bottom product and a distillate. That distillate is then again fed into a third distillation stage. Still again a bottom and a distillate. Now, what can we achieve with that? Can we somehow understand that? And of course we can if we look at the corresponding diagram, the equilibrium diagram, and we know how to read that meanwhile. I have a feed, the original feed, to the first distillation process. This is fed into the first distillation, it's heated up until we reach the two-phase region, lie somewhere with a point that characterizes the state that we reach somewhere in the two-phase region, where we have then, for example, this green separation. We know the level rules, so we know the amounts, we also know the compositions, we know this is the bottom product of the first distillation stage, this is the distillate product. The distillate was then fed into the second distillation stage. The second distillation stage means we are heating this up again until we reach some point somewhere within the two-phase region. Let's assume we reach this orange line, this is the orange tie line characterizing the uh, equilibrium that we reach. We think again in theoretical stages, that is in equilibrium stages. The bottom product then may be this one and the distillate may be this one. This second distillate, distillate is then fed into the third stage. This is shown in magenta, again an example, it's heated up until we reach some point within the two-phase region. We get this as bottom product and this as distillate. And we are happy. We are happy because this distillate is above that composition in the vapor we would have been able to achieve with just a single stage separation. You remember how that was obtained? We started out with the feed composition, this original feed, the black one. Then we looked where we hit the boiling point curve, so the, an infinitely small vapor flow rate was generated that way and that composition would be exactly that one if we, if we hit the boiling point, plot the tie line and that is then the maximum value of the distillate that we can achieve as a single stage distillation. So we are better than that already. Also the Ymax had a composition, uh, had a flow rate that approached zero. How do we do with this magenta distillate? Well, we start out with the feed. We divide this feed into more or less two equal parts. The lever rule tells us the amounts or the flow rates are similar. So let's assume that this is split into two. So that this distillate here of the first 
distillation stage is half the original feed. That is then split again into roughly two to get the second distillate. So we, this is then roughly a fourth of the flow rate of the original feed. That is fed into the third column here, or the third distillation stage. Again, is split roughly into half. So this is roughly an eighth of the original feed. So it's a finite flow rate. It's small, but it's finite. It's not approaching zero. And the purity is higher than that we could achieve with a single stage uh, separation. So in that sense, we are happy. Of course, we are not really satisfied yet because we have this intermediate product, the bottom product of the second phase a stage, the bottom product of the first stage, the bottom product of the third stage. What do we do with them? And then we realize actually that the bottom product of the second stage, for example, in composition is pretty close to the feed of the first stage. The bottom product of the third stage is pretty close to the feed of the second stage. Why don't we recycle that? Why don't we plug this bottom product into that feed or into the same distillation equipment, if you like, and put that bottom into that second column? And that's exactly what we try to do. The process then looks like that. We have a feed, we separate and distillate the bottom product, and now the uh, bottom product of the second stage is fed back into the first uh, stage. The bottom product of the third stage is fed back into the second stage. That way we achieve that the feed actually is only split into two flow rates, the B dot and the B dot, and they have to be larger, of course. We are also recycling, so to speak, this intermediate bottom uh, product flow rates. You can call this some material integration of the cascade. As a next step, we realize that actually we are heating and cooling, cooling and heating, and if you look at the uh, duties, the reboiler duty and the con, uh, condenser duty, then you realize that actually um, the amounts of energy that you need, the power that you need for both is very similar. So the question is, can't we also go for some heat integration? Have some heat transfer by direct contact between the phases. That is, we would actually skip the, the, this heating device and this cooling device just throw it out of the process and say, well, if you just contact the two phases intensely enough, then they will exchange their heat so that everything works. And that's actually what is done. So we exchange, we get rid of these uh, condensers and, uh, cool, uh, and, and heating devices. We, you may call this a, that a heat integration. And that, of course, simplifies the process further. Nevertheless, we have to keep one cooling system one heating system, one reboiler, one condenser, because they don't, can't be matched by anything else. There is no flow rate of something that could compensate this, condens uh, this condenser or that reboiler. At the same time, at this point, one should mention, of course, that there is apparently some flow rate then in this way downward, which is of course a liquid. This was a liquid bottom product. So there's a liquid flow downward and a vapor flow, so to speak, upward. Yes, so this distillate original was vapor, we, get, we skip that, so that is still a vapor. Here as well, this is then still a vapor that is entering this stage. So we have a process, a countercurrent process that way, where a liquid is flowing in that direction and a vapor is flowing in that direction. And some distillate being taken out up here. Okay, now how do we do, how do we con now connect these things so that we achieve something like this? And this is shown in this diagram. Here we have the individual stages. We have the feed into the bottommost uh, theoretical stage, as, as it was before. We have our first stage, where, of course, the vapor is now being removed from the first stage. It's condensed. And then we somehow have to generate this liquid flow rate. And this is done by recycling, so to speak, or by feeding back a part of this condensate into the first stage. So that way we are able to have then this liquid flow rate. Of course, we also remove something of this flow rate from the equipment, which is then constituting our distillate. So we have a multi-stage process with countercurrent flow of liquid and vapor. And exactly that process, multi-stage and countercurrent, is called rectification. So while distillation is the, well, the general description of all these processes, all of this is distillation, if you are more specific, this 
uh, equipment that is constituted like that is rectification, multi-stage countercurrent. Okay. So now what happens actually on these stages? Yeah, can we understand that? Yeah, we, of course we can we'll set up corresponding balances, we'll show how one can design such a process in the next videos, but can we already from just looking at it try to understand a little bit what's going on? Well, we said that actually on each stage there is some uh, heat exchange, some direct heat exchange by mixing the phases. Direct heat exchange in some system that is in equilibrium conditions, that is at boiling point for the liquid and dew point at the, for the vapor, so that it's really in equilibrium. If there some phases are contacting each other, where the entering phases are not in equilibrium, the theoretical stages define that the leaving streams are in equilibrium, so the entering streams are not in equilibrium, but they mix intensely and heat and mass transfer takes place. What happens now is actually that if there is some uh, uh, heavy boiling component in the vapor stream, that is being partially condensed, so that, that goes back with that liquid. At the same time, something has to be evaporated for this internal heat exchange. So that means that the light boiling component is of course preferentially being evaporated from this liquid and leaves that way. So these two streams, the leaving streams, are again in equilibrium and that is achieved by partial condensation and partial evaporation within this stage. And that ensures that actually this vapor flow rate is richer in light boiling component as compared to this uh, vapor flow rate. And this liquid flow rate is enriched in heavy boiling component as compared to this liquid flow rate. This means that overall the light boiling component is being enriched towards the top and the heavy boiling component is being enriched towards the bottom of the equipment. That's what happens. So we have material and heat exchange on each stage. The leaving stages are the leaving flow rates are in equilibrium and there's partial condensation evaporation of components so as to get this get into the state of equilibrium so that the leaving streams really are in equilibrium. Now we have realized in the, in the diagram before for the equilibrium that we can achieve that by essentially arbitrary purity for the distillate and of course here also it holds that the distillate is a finite flow rate so it's really a significant flow rate. We can achieve arbitrary purity here but we cannot achieve arbitrary, arbitrary purity, purity down here apparently. Now that is somehow limited and we know, of course know what to do. Yeah? To achieve arbitrary purity for the distillate we have to add theoretical stages. So we should put in here some theoretical stages as well in order to be able to define also the bottom product purity to some arbitrary value. And that then looks like that. The column that we have is made up of several theoretical stages. The feed is entering somewhere in the middle. There is this so-called rectifying section towards the top from the feed, where the light boiling component is enriched to essentially arbitrary purity. That's then our distillate. And in the so-called stripping section, the heavy boiling component is enriched so that at the bottom of this equipment, we can define the bottom product purity to some arbitrary value. Of course, arbitrary means, of course, uh, that results, of course, directly in a certain possibly large number of theoretical stages that are required to uh, obtain this arbitrary purity, but we can define it and can then see how much equipment effort is that to achieve that purity. How many theoretical stages do I need to achieve those arbitrary purities? And that's actually part of the next lectures, the next videos, that we want to come up with design methods for exactly this setup in order to be able to answer the question how many theoretical stages do we need in either of the parts of this equipment so as to achieve arbitrary purity or the defined purity for the distillate and the bottom product. With that I would like to collect the information that I have transferred, hopefully transferred, as this take-home message, we have seen that the distillation cascades can in principle overcome the limitations that we have seen for the single stage distillation. We can obtain arbitrary purities of the product while keeping 
finite flow rates. So the feed is split into two flow rates, distal width and bottom, and they are defined with respect to their purity. So in the next lectures we will then come up or show, uh, I will show you how such a multi-stage process can then be designed. Thank you for now and I hope I see you again in the next lecture.